Hello, welcome to my talk. My name is Parallax and PS has asked me whether I'd like to speak a little bit about a demo tool I've been working on for several years called BART. I'm happy to oblige and I hope you'll get something out of me describing the motivation for creating the tool, how it can be used to make demos and also how it works under the hood. But before I delve into all those details, let me just quickly introduce myself. So professionally, I've been working in the games industry for some years, mostly doing AAA conversions for titles on consoles, tablets and PC. And currently, I'm working as a platform engineer for industry applications at Unity. I'm also a founder of the PC demo group Spectrum. And within Spectrum, I've been involved in uh, several PC demos that were mostly made with tools I've been working on, because tooling is pretty much the focus for me in the demo scene. You can follow me on Twitter uh, using the handle parallax underscore sd. And uh, having said that, let's have a quick look at the agenda. So I'd like to separate the talk into two areas. First, I'd like to talk about the motivation for a new tool, what it's been used for and how it's used, and then I'd like to describe some technical aspects of how this is done. I'll only focus on the big picture because I think the architecture here is more important and probably also more interesting than the specific details of how some kind of editor or service was implemented. Um, I also have a small hands-on part that shows the basics of how to work with the tool and some fairly recent stuff about gamepad motion capturing I implemented for fun. Uh, I'll also talk a bit about our integrated C-Sharp build system and finally, I'll end with a conclusion. So, before I talk about the demos that have been released using BART, it's probably sensible to just quickly talk about the origins of the tool and uh, the name itself. BART is German for beard. And the reason for that is uh, that back in 2009, we wanted to make a quick game release uh, for Breakpoint and uh, in the game uh, players would play a hairdresser and work on several customers and improve their looks in some way and we thought it might be sensible to have some kind of tooling uh, to help with designing the levels. Um, well it turns out the game was never released, we were never finished, but we had some kind of foundation uh, that we could use uh, to uh, extend it and uh, make a demo system, uh, make actually several demo systems and the current iteration is what I'm talking about in this presentation. So uh, another interesting uh, tidbit is that Spectrum actually never released any demos using BART. Uh, there's another demo group called SpacePix, who have released 10 demos uh, using BART now. Uh, you can see four of them here on the screen. I guess one of the most known demos is Hello Kevin on the top left. Then there is the Evoke Invitation on the top right, Echo Chamber on the uh, bottom left, and the Offensive demo. But of, uh, as said, there are actually 10 demos that have been released. And some of them are quite successful. So let's talk a little bit about motivation for creating a new demo tool. As I said, BART is not the first demo tool I've been working on. The previous one was called Henneke. And uh, Henneke pretty much did what many other demo tools are doing, I guess, which is provide the means to instantiate some kinds of entities inside a graph each entity would be able to modify what a user would see on the scene, would probably have some kinds of properties. Those properties would be able to be animated by the user. There would also be some kind of uh, sharing of data between entities. And I guess 
in a way that pretty much worked for us uh, for a long time. Uh, but there is one thing that we thought was kind of missing, which is flexibility. Because you see, when we are working on demos, uh, oftentimes we found that a specific entity um, would need some new kind of functionality or some kind of new property. And uh, when we uh, found that we needed some new functionality, the only way to implement that was to save the project, go out of the demo tool, open Visual Studio, add the new functionality, compile everything, reload the project in the demo tool, wait for everything to be loaded and find out whether the functionality actually works or not. And so, in a way, that means we had pretty bad turnaround times. And when you have bad turnaround times, that also means that you cannot be as creative as you might want to be because you're spending so much time just waiting and uh, not working on your actual content. And uh, so one motivation for our demo system that's embedded in BART was that we wanted to do all that while the demo tool is running without having to go into Visual Studio and uh, reload the project and everything. It should just work while the demo tool is, is running and update everything instantly. Um, another motivation, at least for me, was uh, that, um, as you will see, BART is a pretty big piece of software and I guess there's this argumentation that uh, you should not put more work in and just, be uh, put, uh, just go straight to the point where you want to go. Um, BART itself uh, is pretty over-engineered, but I personally enjoy just, I guess, pushing the limits a little bit. And so, I, I, at least for BART, I adopted this because I can mindset um, which is something I can enjoy when doing it in my free time. Obviously, while working uh, in a professional capacity, there are entirely different motivations and I couldn't do something like that. I'd now like to talk about the functionality of our demo system. And I guess it makes sense to do that from the perspective of a user who wants to make a demo. So the first thing a user would want to do is provide the project with a bunch of scripts. Each script is a text file that is either written in Lua or in C Sharp and is basically a template for a node that can be instantiated in a graph later. Um, a script might also include information about input and output pins, um, which is basically data that flows into the node might be used in its calculation in some way and then again flows out of the node. Now when those scripts are all finished, the user would want to create a new graph and instantiate nodes based on those scripts. Um, the user can also use output pins and connect them with input pins of other nodes and basically create a directly acyclical graph that is then uh, executed in a in known order. Uh, in this case here, we have a viewport width that's provided by the red node um, and uh, then consumed by another node, I guess for rendering purposes. There's also the possibility to animate input pins. Uh, we have a built-in tracking system that's based on the handling uh, set forth by the GNU Rocket project. So uh, we can just say, bind a specific input pin to a column in our tracker and then enter data for that column set interpolation and basically drive how uh, the demo will evolve over time. Now, when the user is happy with all the patterns he has created for a specific graph, he can then uh, create a new sequence and drag the pattern data into the sequence timeline and uh, the alignment of those uh, track uh, uh, of those items, track items, will basically describe how the demo is going to look in the end. Um, 
we need two sequences for making a demo because we have uh, a main sequence that's used for rendering the actual demo and we actually have a always reused sequence that's uh, used for creating our loading screen. Now when the user is happy uh, and finished with everything, uh, the only thing to do is uh, create uh, the demo itself and that's done by launching the demo export dialog. Um, in the demo export dialog there are certain options uh, the user can tweak. Uh, click the export the demo button, then all the resources will be collected, perhaps some extra code will be generated depends all on uh, the specifics uh, of the flags the user has set and out comes a single executable that's ready uh, and can be released at the demo party. So now that I've described how Bart is working from the perspective of a user, I'd also like to do the same uh, for developers. And I guess the first thing to realize is that Bart pretty much is comparable uh, to the design of Visual Studio. The reason for that is that back when I started the project, I also um, worked with the Visual Studio extensibility model quite a lot and it influenced me uh, because I thought um, it's kind of cool how you can extend Visual Studio in so many ways. And I thought it would be a cool approach to have for a demo tool. And so uh, the basic idea of BART is that it's based on three pillars. The first is that I have a certain uh, bunch of core services, services uh, that are so integral that it makes sense to just have a base implementation that can be used by any functionality within the tool. Stuff like being able to create new editors or launch new editors. Uh, stuff like um, using the status bar, writing outputs to the output log and so on. Then the next pillar is that there are certain basic UI uh, elements that uh, the tool just comes with, like uh, obviously a main window. Then the main window has docking functionality and there is other stuff you know from Visual Studio, like uh, it has a solution explorer, it also has an output view for logging stuff to uh, different tabs and uh, more demo tool like uh, things like a, properties, a property grid um, and uh, yeah, elements like that. And third, um, there is this concept of packages and the package is nothing else but just an assembly that resides uh, within the directory of the demo tool. And the demo tool will use reflection to find out whether the assembly actually is a package. And it is a package when it implements, in my case, the iPackage interface. Uh, and when it does, uh, it uh, uses that package to extend the functionality of part tool. And in the next slide, I'd like to uh, go a little bit more into detail uh, for what a package can do. Now, this is a visualization of the different components a BART package might contain. Um, as you can see, many of those components are factories. As an example, an editor factory that's added to BART means that BART can now launch a new kind of editor. And in that same line, we also have support for project factories, project item factories, or property designer factories. Property designer factories are uh, factories that can extend what can be shown on the property grid. There is also a possibility to extend the context menus within the main window and within Solution Explorer. And it's also possible to add new system services to the registry. Um, those services can then be consumed by the package itself or other packages also can consume the services coming from a different package. Um, then there's a concept we are calling named pipe command handlers. That's a convenient feature that uh, we are using uh, as an example when exporting data from Cinema 4D. We have an exporter plugin and that, that exporter plugin can talk to the demo tool directly using named pipes. 
and the named pipe command handler then basically will interpret whatever the request from Cinema um, is wanting and send out some, some reply data. And uh, last but not least, there is also a custom initialization code, uh, which is something we are using for our demo system to launch extra tool windows, such as the actual demo window that renders our content. Having said that, Obviously, this is an abstract description of what a BART package does. Uh, we have a concrete implementation uh, that realizes our entire demo system, which is called Stubble. And the next slide is going uh, into detail of what Stubble is actually doing. So this is actually just a summary of the functionality of Stubble, since Stubble is going to be a larger part of my presentation, spanning multiple slides. Um, basically, as said, it's our demo creation package of choice. It comes with a standalone player, um, has an engine window uh, and various editors, some of which I have been showing you beforehand in uh, the description of how to make a demo from a user perspective. Then it's since a while also comes with an integrated c -sharp build system I'm going to elaborate on later also and its focus is uh, on rapid prototyping. I've just earlier looked at my initial commit for this package and it seems that it's already five years old so time flies. Um, but um, before I'm going to delve into the architecture and certain components of Stubble I'd like to give you a little bit of a hands-on presentation. Okay, so we are in BART and uh, the first thing I'd like to do is open the sequence we are seeing in the stubble render view here. So let's double click that and the sequence editor opens and inside the sequence editor I can just click play to see what's going on currently and as you can see Basically, we have some kind of tunnel, and the tunnel is animated in a particular way. Okay, so uh, if we want to see how this animation was actually done, I can just double click a default pattern here. And it opens the tracker with uh, one binding to a input pin called distance. Um, and uh, in this tracker, I can just move along and change values using the keyboard and when I'm doing that it has a direct effect. Um, if I want to see how the graph actually looks I just go to the graph tab and I see that here in this case my entire graph just consists of one node with three input pins, distance is bound to the pattern editor and the other two pins are unbound so I can change them using the property grid if I wanted to so if I drag along here on the X property, then you can see that this changes the rendering of the render view directly. Another way to change the rendering of the render view would be to connect it to the output of another node. And I've prepared a very simple node called modify. Let's create one here. Modify has only an output pin, so let's just connect the output pin to the X input pin of the quad and let's look what that uh, is having uh, as an effect. And you might see that uh, the X property is slowly getting smaller and then larger again. So uh, I might want to change the frequency of uh, this code. And so what I could do is just double click the modify node and it opens up the, the, the text for the modify node. Let's just dock it next to the graph here. All right. And now, uh, as you can see, the text itself basically uh, consists of a Lua table called modify. It has an initialize function, it has a shutdown function, and it has an execute function. And the execute function basically uh, does a sign calculation with a hard-coded uh, frequency. 
and hard-coded scale and hard-coded off uh, offset. Now, I might want to introduce a new pin, um, which I can then modify um, for the frequency, something like that. So there is this create inputs function. Um, if I change that to add uh, a new input pin called frequency, uh, then I can down there in the execution of my node use that. So instead of self frequency, I would uh, write i dot frequency dot value and save everything. And as you can see, instantly um, modify as a new property called frequency. Um, now frequency is 1.0, but perhaps. I'd like to have a frequency of 5. Now let's look at it again. And as you can see now, uh, this whole uh, horizontal uh, uh, changing of our tunnel is, is considerably fast. Um, another thing I might want to do is just sever that connection again. Go to the pattern editor and add a new binding to X. So let's select quad 1, X, let's make that column a little bigger, bigger. and then basically I could just enter some values there, copy paste that a little. and we would have some nonsensical stuff like that. I could also change the interpolation. Now everything is linearly interpolated and it should make a visual difference as you can see. And basically uh, that's what I wanted to show you for hands-on. Uh, as said, if the user was was happy with the result, F10 launches the export dialog and export the demo would create a new demo. Okay, so we're back with the slides. This illustration here shows the stubble package and all the components it contains. I'm not going to describe each and every one of those components Let's just suffice it to say that all the editors and all the functionality I've been showing you earlier obviously has to be realized in one way or another. Um, I guess one thing that's uh, interesting uh, to point out is that we have a, a dedicated resource monitoring service. That's a service that uh, tries to find out whether all resources that are currently used within our system are up to date. And when a user changes a resource using an editor or when a file changes that's, uh, that's linked to a resource uh, in the file system, then uh, the resource monitoring uh, will try to reload the resource or the entire thing. Um, resource monitoring itself also uses other, uh, other services such as the uh, file system watcher service, which is a base service of the bot. Uh, tool um, and just subscribes to the changed event and um, reacts on any files that are changed. Then we have named pipe handlers. Um, the scene importer API is basically what I described beforehand when we want to export data from Cinema 4D. And then there's also extra support for C Sharp compilation which is needed because uh, we have dedicated Visual Studio support. Uh, we can tell the demo tool to generate a Visual Studio solution and include all the Lua and C Sharp scripts um, that are part of our BART solution. Um, and then users can just use Visual Studio. And within the Visual Studio project, users can just run the project and running the project based on uh, the selected uh, configuration will tell the demo tool either to recompile its state and update everything or uh, to uh, allow uh, 
attaching of a debugger. Last but not least, we have two tool windows. One is the Lua REPL, which, which is basically a text editor where you can evaluate the current Lua state. Nowadays, we are not using it as much as we did in the past because most of our logic is now C sharp, but uh, it's still there and it's still uh, useful sometimes. And obviously, last but not least, we have the engine window itself. So, uh, having said, all about that. Uh, the next block is going to touch upon C sharp incremental compilation, something I think differentiates double quite a bit from many demo tools, um, and so I wanted to elaborate a little bit on that. So the motivation for C sharp scripting comes from a time when we found that adding more and more Lua scripts worked until a certain point. But from that point onwards, performance would degrade and it was no longer possible to do what we really wanted to do. And so we researched whether we could increase the performance for our Lua VM, but we were already pretty much as fast as we ever would be able to get. And so basically we had two options from there. Um, one would be to extract as much logic as possible from our Lua scripts and pull it all into the player and re-implement it as C-sharp or introduce another scripting language that was just faster. Um, the first option would mean that we would again have problems with backwards compatibility and we also would reintroduce problems with turnaround times because the more logic we had in the player, the more we would be forced to go back into Visual Studio when something would be changed. So. The first option was really out of the question. We had to implement C sharp scripting. And C sharp scripting itself, apart from being faster, also has another advantage, which is that we now could reference external assemblies where the source code was not available directly, which sometimes can be quite helpful. As an example, it's now possible to just reference an assembly that adds gamepad support and we can then use the gamepad support to do stuff within the demo tool without statically adding gamepad support as a base service to the tool source code. So one problem with c -sharp scripting of course is that the more c -sharp scripts were part of the project, the larger the memory footprint of a full compilation would become. And so we wanted to find some kind of a balance, basically uh, because there are two ways to implement C-sharp scripting. The first way would be to unload the old C-sharp source code and then reload the new version. However, in .NET this is only possible when the app domain that holds the assembly that shall be unloaded will be unloaded. Furthermore, since app domains are isolated, in a way comparable to processes, communication between different app domains also would require us to serialize all communication between the tool and the script app domain. Finally, since resources can be defined in script in our system, unloading its app domain would also unload, unload resources, which would lead to unacceptably long update times. And so the trade-off I came up with is something I'm calling incremental compilation and it basically means that changed scripts should reference as much code as possible that's already loaded anyhow while only compiling as little new code as needed. And I'll go into more detail how this is done in the next few slides. Okay, so when we compile c -sharp code within BART, we are using the Microsoft Roslyn compiler. That's the same compiler that's also used by Visual Studio itself, and so we get pretty nice results out of the box. Um, the motivation for incremental compilation is that um, instead of recompiling everything and um, having the memory usage of an entirely new assembly, we try to only compile what code really has changed and obviously also all the types that depend on the changed code. 
And so that means that we have a little bit more of complexity because now we have to do type tracking and uh, we have to do dependency analysis, but in the end it's a payoff for memory usage. Um, and before I'm going to describe how incremental compilation um, is done within our system, let me just quickly describe some terms I'm going to use later on. I have three terms I'd like to discuss real quick. Um, the first one would be the build context, which includes all the data we are handing over to the c -sharp compiler. This includes the c -sharp files themselves and all assembly references, then the optimization level and whether we actually want to serialize the assembly to disk or load the assembly, and various other flags comparable to this. The next term would be the build result, which basically encapsulates the binary executable data the compiler created for us if compilation was successful. This may also hold an optional assembly based on the flags we chose for the build context. And finally, we have the compilation snapshot, which may either be a full snapshot that references all c -sharp files in the demo project, or a snapshot for incremental compilation that references some c -sharp files and some previous snapshots. For each file path in the snapshot, we also have a list of types that are described by the file contents, and we also hold a list of types, each of those types references. And we find the types that are contained within a C-sharp file by implementing a Rosling syntax walker and basically just collecting all the types using that. Um, finally, each snapshot also holds the build result that's associated with the snapshot. Um, having said that, uh, I'll now talk a little bit about the services that are used within BART to realize incremental compilation, and these are going to reference the terms I just described. So in this illustration here we can see that um, c -sharp compilation actually depends on the interplay of three different services. Uh, right on the right we have the c -sharp service, and the c -sharp service only receives some kind of build context and generates the assembly and the compilation diagnostics and also gives us information about the types it created. Um, so the question is, which kind of build context should we feed to the c service? And this is uh, the job of the build context retrieval service. The build context retrieval service itself, however, does not know um, which c -sharp files are part of our project because it's uh, entirely independent from the demo system itself. So there is a third service, which is called c -sharp context service, which basically is implemented by the demo system to give us information about which c -sharp files are actually available, um, where the emission file path should be, whether there is some kind of um, default assembly references, uh, and so on. Um, Having that kind of information, the build context retrieval service then has to decide whether it should do a full or an incremental compilation and uh, afterwards generate uh, snapshots from that information that the C-sharp service returns um, and handle everything so that incremental compilation just works. Um, how this uh, is done in detail is then uh, part of the next slide. Okay, so for incremental compilation, the question basically is what's the minimal amount of files we have to recompile and which already compiled assemblies can we reuse in order to get our new compilation state? And for this to work, there are also two other things of note. The first thing is that it's not, not a compilation error to compile a file that generates a type that's also included once by an assembly reference. The compiled type will then take precedence over the reference type and we will just ignore this specific warning that's emitted by the compiler for us. However, it's not easily possible to reference multiple assemblies that share types with the same full name. At this point, there will be a collision which will lead to a compilation error. 
Having said that, my approach to finding a sensible combination of previous assemblies and new code is to use good old brute force, which goes pretty much like this. First, we loop through all the file paths, uh, all C-sharp file paths, and for each C-sharp file, we collect the newest snapshot that directly contains the file. And we're always guaranteed to find a snapshot because the tool will always generate a full snapshot when the demo project is initially loaded. Then we look at whether the file has changed by comparing its last write date field with the information that's stored for the file in the snapshot. And if the file has changed, we not only collect the file itself, but we also collect all transitively dependent files. Transitively dependent files are all files that contain types that are dependent on the types from the original file and also all files that are dependent on those files until we have the transitive file. Next, in step two, we look at all possible non-colliding K combinations of all snapshots. So basically, we start with each snapshot in isolation and then add more and more other snapshots where distinct sets can be formed. And for each of these snapshot combinations, we can find out which types we're still missing and which files we have to add for this reason. So we're actually ending up with all type definitions of the project. And having done that in step three, we can then order those combinations and choose the variant where the number of files we have to compile is minimal. And finally, in step four, there might be snapshots that have not been used for the collection part in step one, and so we're just throwing them away, which keeps the number of combinations of snapshots limited, which is quite important because obviously when calculating the binomial coefficient for each k between one and the number of snapshots, um, this would quickly explode otherwise. And having done that, that's how I do incremental compilation selection. Now, in the next slide, the last thing I'd like to talk about concerning c -sharp compilation is external assembly references. So, this is just a quick extension to our c -sharp compilation system I added recently when I found that Roslyn has built in support for something called response files. Um, you may have seen response files before. Unity, as an example, has direct support for response files. There's this cs.rsp file you can add, where you can add additional assembly references and stuff like that. Um, stuff you can tell, uh, you, can, you can give to the compiler to modify the compilation process. And I thought, might be sensible to have something in our tool too. And the cool thing about that is that now we can reference additional assemblies where we don't have the source code and we can also say parts of our script code might only be made for running inside the demo tool and might be excluded when exporting. Um, later on I extended that idea a little bit and now it's possible to say um, we want to have a player that is exported either with external assembly references merged into the player assembly or by, uh, by default uh, left out entirely. And you can see a screenshot here how this is looking basically. It's just a text file where we indicate the additional assembly files we want to include and where we also can indicate any uh, preprocessor symbol definitions. And um, why am I showing you this? Well, um, I recently had some time during my uh, vacation where I thought um, I might just as well use this to do something fun. And so the next slide will be about a little motion capture note I threw together which is based on working with the gamepad where you can use the gamepad to record live data and uh, animate 
various, uh, various properties inside the system with the gamepad. So on this slide I prepared a video that shows the motion capture node I described before in action. And let me just, before clicking play, elaborate a little bit on what's going to happen. The idea is that when a graph is prepared in a certain way, users could drag in a motion capture node and the motion capture node would do some kind of reflection on the graph level and find all the nodes and all the associated input pins and provide the user with the user interface when pressing the start button on the gamepad. By the way, based on the brilliant dear in GUI system. Um, and this user interface would allow the user to calibrate gamepad axis and map the axis to a certain value range that's then used to override the input pin that's selected. And uh, having done that, the user can then go into a record mode and record the data and do some kind of motion capturing. And after the motion capturing is done, the job of the motion capture node is to serialize this data and ensure that the demo system has access to the data uh, as a resource. And uh, this makes everything that's recorded permanent. Um, so let me click play. So now that the recording is done, there's only a last step here that shows that we actually recorded something and also that we can scrub through our audio in both ways. Okay, so concluding my talk, I think what I learned when building BART is that the flexibility that bought by creating an architecture with many extension points might be daunting at first, but can really work out in the long term. Um, the development of the stubble package alone took over a year before we could even think about using the system for making demos. But now, however, after a lot of work, all the foundations are pretty stable and so we can invest time in fun stuff such as the motion capturing thing I showed you and investing in an actual modern renderer. And in that regard, I think that maybe all the best stuff is still to come. Um, thanks to PS for giving me the opportunity to speak about our demo tool. I hope you found some parts of my talk interesting. Thanks for watching.